Good morning. You're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines. New detections of the novel coronavirus continue to rise in the Hubei province of China. The latest death toll stands at 1,355. India's retail inflation rises to 7.59% in January, the highest level since May 2014, led by higher food prices and telecom tariffs. The index of industrial production, meanwhile, contracted in the month of December by 0.3%. A Bloomberg poll of economists had pegged the, the IIP at a positive 1.7%. Yes Bank delays its third quarter results that were to be reported uh, on Friday. The lender says that it is analyzing non-binding bids uh, for capital raising from four investors. And oil prices fall to a, a, a one-year uh, low on Monday after the Organization of uh, Petroleum Exporting Countries or OPEC slashes its demand forecast for the first quarter by 4.4 lakh barrels per day. Let's talk about the U.S. markets now. They continued to shrug off fears of the coronavirus on Wednesday. Benchmark indices regi <coughs> excuse me, registered uh, record closing highs. The Dow and the Nasdaq gained close to 1% each, while uh, the S&P 500 underperformed. Ranita Young of Bloomberg News brings you all the trading action on Wall Street in this report. U.S. stocks closed out Wednesday's session higher. The Dow Jones Industrial Average and S&P 500 both touched record highs during the session. This all happened as investors believed the global economy can bounce back from the effects of the deadly coronavirus. Now, some signs came in that the spread of the illness is beginning to slow a little bit. And corporate earnings season continues. One of the latest companies to report was agricultural giant Bungie, which reported better than expected results and shares rose on that news. And during the session, we saw the, the owner of 7-Eleven, the convenience store chain, is said to be eyeing a purchase of Marathon's Speedway gas station division. And this is according to people familiar with the matter. WTI crude oil rallied during the session and natural gas was low. Lower treasuries and gold, however, weakened during the session. That's a look at your Wall Street action on Wednesday. In New York, I'm Renita Young for Bloomberg News. On to the latest from the coronavirus. China's Hubei province says it has detected 15,000 new cases of the disease after uh, a, a change in its uh, reporting methods. It carried out a review of the past detected cases to include what they call a clinically diagnosed cases. Selena Wang and Yvonne Mann of Bloomberg News bring you the latest. This is a massive tick up in new cases. I mean, yesterday you had about 2,000, which was the lowest number of cases in a month. So there was actually a lot of optimism about stabilization. And now it's jumped to more than 14,800 new cases. So it's unclear at this point what this means for that recent trend of stabilization or if this is just a one time spike because of this methodology change. What we know so far is that Hubei province has done an investigation of past suspected cases. And they've said they've started to include clinically diagnosed cases as confirmed cases in its daily reporting, which it says aligns uh, more similarly to other provinces in China. They're also now adding cases that were confirmed through imaging scans alongside those confirmed with the previous method of testing kits. Now, over the past few days, there's also been a lot of criticism around some changes in China's methodology previously, some debate about what it meant a few days ago when China's National Health Commission released some guidance that seemed to indicate they would no longer be counting patients who had tested positives but were not showing symptoms and those people were not being included in confirmed cases. So in the past few days there has been a lot of debate about the lack of transparency around the methodology. In the meantime, you do have the Centers for Disease and Control from the U.S. saying that for weeks they've been offering to send their experts into the center of the outbreak in Hubei province but have not received an invitation yet. Yvonne, and we've been tracking that cruise ship, the Western them, after they were turned away from five different ports on fear of a virus outbreak. What do we know? Yeah, some good news. The more than 2,200 crew members and passengers on that luxury liner able to go home after the liner was able to find a haven. 
in Cambodia, thanks to the government lending out a helping hand and allowing it to enter into the country. That's the live picture you're seeing right now, about to arrive in Sihanoukville, which is south of Cambodia. What we are learning is that the cruise ship will be remaining at the port for a couple of days, and passengers and crew members will be then moved to Phnom Penh, where they'll be finally able to go home after uh, two weeks stuck at sea uh, after departing from Hong Kong on February 1st. Carnival now also warning when it comes to the, the financial impact of all this as well. Of course, they're still dealing with that Yokohama uh, cruise liner that's off there, uh, the Diamond Princess, where 174 people had contracted the disease. Uh, they're saying that this virus could have a material impact on its results now. We've also learned that when it came to a cruise liner that was set to embark in Yokohama on February 15th, that has now also been cancelled. Mm. And of course, we know all hands on deck when it comes to trying to find a treatment for this virus. Selena, what do we know about the clinical trials in China? Right, an entire flurry of patient studies that are starting to identify the best treatment here. There are some 77 clinical trials targeting the coronavirus that have been registered in China since January 23rd. And these trials really run the gamut. They include the high profile study of Gilead Sciences experimental antiviral drug, AbbVie's HIV pill, even tests of some traditional Chinese herbal medicines, and even whether the sport of shadow boxing may aid recovery. So for Gilead's experimental drug, which was originally developed to fight Ebola. It has shown some signs of potency against SARS, and it is being tested at a hospital in Wuhan after a patient in the U.S. appeared to respond to it before. Some 761 patients are expected to be enrolled in the trial, and 66 percent of them will be dosed with the drug. The remainder will receive the standard treatment and placebo. That's according to Xinhua News. But again, despite a lot of investor optimism here, vaccine candidates can be developed relatively quickly, but to confirm that it's safe and useful in humans is a very long process. You even had the World Health Organization warning against any immediate hope here, given that it could be 18 months before we see the first treatment. 18 months before the first treatment. Meanwhile, there's another fallout of the coronavirus uh, fears, and uh, that has been that the fact that uh, the Mobile World Congress, which is the biggest annual showcase of the global electronics industry that was supposed to take place in Barcelona, has been scrapped. Now, Mark Gurman of uh, Bloomberg Technologies uh, tells us the significance of this move. It's significant in the sense that it's going to have a true economic impact on the city of Barcelona, which, you know, does everything it can to support this conference. Basically, this, the, the city becomes the conference uh, for that week. It's going to put a delay or a halt uh, on a lot of business meetings and potential deals between carriers and component suppliers. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the overall impact on the technology industry besides a little bit of a financial you know, headwind, is not going to be significant, right? Thankfully, we're in the year 2020, and these things can be rescheduled, whether in another place or over a video conference. Mark, what were we expecting from that conference? Yeah, I mean, we were expecting a lot of, you know, hoopla around 5G and all the backroom deals that can get done around that. Uh, but from a consumer perspective, uh, I know Motorola was set to announce a slew of new flagship 5G phones there. Uh, a few other companies were going to announce new phones, but none of the major giants, right? You weren't going to see anything new from Apple, Samsung, or, or any of the big players we, we talk so much about. So we're not really missing out on those. And of course, you know, we're in the time where lots of tech companies like to make these big splash announcements on their own timelines rather than those of a major conference. All right, let's see what else is making headlines across the globe. Sue Keenan of Bloomberg News brings you the first word headlines. OPEC is slashing its forecast for global oil as the coronavirus hits demand in China and further afield. The cartel is reducing projections for fuel use in the first quarter by 440,000 barrels of oil a day, or about a third. Prices have sunk as the inflection leaves businesses idle and millions of people quarantined. Saudi Arabia wants an emergency meeting to consider new production cuts. 
Sticking with crude, U.S. oil chiefs are privately warning the Trump administration that they will struggle to produce the oil and gas that China has committed to buy under the phase one trade deal. Beijing would order about $52 billion of energy over the next two years, and that's the equivalent of an extra 1 million barrels of oil and 100 tankers of LNG. The American Petroleum Institute says that would place a severe strain on current capacity. To the U.S. and Fed Chairman Jay Powell, who says that low rates and crisis error tools are now a fact of life for the central bank. This was his second day of testimony before lawmakers in Washington. Powell told lawmakers that the current level of interest rates means fiscal policy has to support the economy if it weakens. He also said the impact of the coronavirus will soon show up in economic data, but it's still too early to tell if it'll have any material change on the U.S. economy's outlook. Low rates are not really a choice anymore. They are a fact of reality, and they're yeah. likely to remain, in, so we will have less room to cut. That means it's much more likely that we'll have to turn to the tools that we used in the financial crisis when we hit the lower bound. Which is? Which, are, which is uh, forward guidance, uh, large-scale asset purchases of longer-term securities to drive longer-term rates down and support the economy. We will use those tools. I believe we will use them aggressively. And finally, President Trump says he doesn't mind if the Philippines terminates its long-standing military agreement with the U.S., this despite his defense secretary saying it would be a move in the wrong direction. The president said such a decision would save the U.S. a lot of money and that it would be, or he would be, okay with it. A Manila-Washington split may complicate U.S. efforts to contest Beijing's growing influence in the South China Sea. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Sue Keen, and this is Bloomberg. All right, let's turn to the trade setup for the day. I'm joined by Darshan Mehta, who's going to tell you all about that, and also to tell you what's uh, happening in the futures and options space. Morning, Darshan. Reasonable day of trade uh, yesterday, at least for the benchmarks. How are we looking to start today? Yeah, today, it'll look flat because the U.S. markets did reasonably well. Asia's not started off um, that good. Uh, SGX Nifty is absolutely flat. You can just see it's down almost six points currently. So, so the trend curve certainly doesn't uh, uh, indicate that there could be too much variance. Now, let's see how we panned out in trade uh, yesterday. Yesterday was a decent day as far as the Nifty is concerned. Again, and that was led by you know Reliance as well as HUL. But apart from it, they were selling on the mid cap and the small cap end of the market. And now, the Nifty, Bank Nifty also uh, did well, but it was clearly the nifty that grabbed the headlines the psu banking index was down two percent and the nifty bank was up almost six tenths of a percent how did uh, the uh, adrs pan out in trade vedanta was up one percent but decent close coming in from the other ADRs, HDFC Bank was up half a percent, so that's the ADR trend for you. Uh, among the other ADRs, Infosys was up two and a half percent, so some of the IT and software companies are uh, doing well. Uh, in terms of how the fund flows panned out in trade, the FIs, marginal buyers, DI bought in almost 340 crores in the cash market. Now, if you're looking at what contributed to the Nifty, uh, HUL, ICICI Bank, and Reliance, and that is why if you're looking at ICICI Bank and Kotak, that is the reason that the Nifty Bank was up, but the Nifty private sector bank was impacted, PSU Bank was in by impacted by SBI, which which contributed negatively, and HUL was one of the star performers in trade yesterday. Uh, how did the FNO market pan out in trade? We are above the 12,200 mark in trade, so put writers are extremely aggressive. Short covering was seen on the Nifty. Uh, in trade yesterday, uh, the Nifty Bank again saw short covering. Now, if you take a look at where positions are being built, uh, the 12,000 uh, put writers are very, very active. So this is a very, very big support for the market. And at high levels, 12,500 is the resistance. In yesterday's trade, again, put writers would have become much more aggressive at 12,100 and 12,200. And that is why the PCR probably will also come down because they are much more active. Now, in terms of uh, uh, the WIX, the WIX was down 2% uh, given that there was nothing much happening on the market. Uh, the PCR also moved up to levels of 1.60 from 1.38 given the aggressive put writing that you saw in uh, uh, the options. Now, in terms of stocks that moved, uh, you had Bar Finance Corporation which saw fresh buying post the numbers that came out. 
Max Financial saw open interest build up of 14% on the long side. Uh, Jubilant Foodwork, again, uh, uh, a couple of days of weakness is something that we're doing. We're seeing Balkrishna Industries at record high. So there is positive traction that's coming in in some of the counters. Now, in terms of stocks which saw open interest decline, you had United Breweries which saw open interest decline of 10%, and that saw long unwinding. LNT Finance uh, also saw long unwinding that came in. Uh, Indable Housing Finance fell in significantly at the end of the day, and that also saw long unwinding that came. Thanks so much for that, Darshan. All right, on to stocks that you have to watch out for in trade uh, today. And Nikki Mirchandani is here to tell you all about that. Nikki, over to you. Good morning, Alex. A couple of them. Actually, I'm going to start off with earnings first. IRCTC, good set of numbers, solid set of numbers rather. Top line, we saw a 64% uptick there. That essentially the revenue growth was driven by internet ticketing business. Catering growth was modest to an extent. Internet ticketing uh, revenue grew due to re uh, reintroduction of service charge, which was reinstated from 1st September 2009, which was stopped post demonetization. That was the top line. Pro uh, profitability, or rather the bottom line performance, grew by three folds. EBITDA uh, was uh, super for this company, strong, uh, 2.7 times higher. The tax rates also came in lower as compared to uh, the corresponding quarter. Overall, you also saw in raw material cost, which has a percent of sales, you know, which uh, in lower and in turn affected or in turn aided the margin performance of the company. We are also looking at Ashok Leland where the results are below estimates. I am going to highlight the volume growth figure first because uh, that number we have seen a 29% decline on there year on year basis. The revenue that has seen a downtick of around 36.5%. Net profitability too has come down by 92% year on year basis. That comes on dismal operational performance. Margins effectively have also taken a hit which could be attributed to higher discounting and inventory correction, which in turn has also laid on or had a bearing on the bottom line performance of the company. This TV, where from top line itself the disappointment creeps in revenue, uh, we see a 42.8 percent downtick there. EBITDA, however, the operation costs to an extent were in control because of which the EBITDA was down just by 5 percent. Nevertheless, the company reported a net loss of more than 60 odd crore in this quarter. We're also looking at Natco Pharma, where the numbers. Uh, are again dismal set of numbers. Uh, top line we saw 13.4% downtick. Profitability has taken a hit, and margins have shrunk due to higher employee expenses and other expenses. Overall, the EBITDA in absolute terms, the number came in lower by 38.2%. We are also looking at PI Industries, where fairly set, good set of numbers there. Top line, a 20% uptick there, strong operational show. We are looking at a 25% growth. Revenue has been driven, uh, growth has been driven on strong performance seen in both the domestic as well as export segment. Uh, also, a um, bunch of other uh, news that we are looking at, apart from the earnings, will be Godrej Properties, which in turn has challenged the NGT order. Uh, uh, Cautioning uh, environmental not granted to one of its housing project in uh, Bengaluru, and also we're looking at Charlotte Hotels, which has been now deleted from MSCI Index Domestic Small Cap Index. So that's also one counter that we like to keep an eye out. All right, thanks so much for that, Nikki. Now, uh, if you were watching Bloomberg Quint uh, last evening, you would have noticed that there were a couple of uh, major uh, macroeconomic data points that uh, were released. First up, uh, India's retail inflation, of course, for the month of January, uh, accelerated to 7.59%, primarily led by foodstuffs. And also you had a contraction in the index of industrial production, where, in fact, uh, a, a consensus estimate of uh, uh, economists had pegged it at a positive number. Uh, to tell you all about that and what it means, here's Pallavi Nahata. Retail inflation for January 2020 was the highest since May 2014. This was largely driven by expensive food items and higher telecom tariffs. Inflation stood at 7.6% in January 2020 compared to 7.35% in December 2019. It also came in higher than the 7.4% that was estimated by a Bloomberg poll of 40 economists. It has also remained above the Monetary Policy Committee's comfort band of 2 to 6% for the second straight month. The key culprit behind higher inflation continues to be food prices. While economists sometimes tend to look through higher food prices when determining policy responses, the fact is that higher food prices adversely and very quickly impact most Indians. So what's really hurting the budget for Indian households?
The economic survey judged price changes in the economy by looking at the common thali and what goes into it. So let's look at broadly what goes into making a thali and how much more it's costing us today compared to an year ago. Onion prices rose by over 300% in December last year. Now, even as they appear to have peaked, they're still rising by 247% on an annual basis in January. The other most commonly used vegetables, potatoes and tomatoes, are showing conflicting trends. Potatoes grew at 63%, while tomatoes rose by 12% annually. While the spike in food inflation began with vegetables, it is now fairly broad-based. Cereal prices rose by 5.25%, while meat, fish and eggs rose by over 10% in January. Pulses, which are critical to the Indian diet to meet our protein quota, rose by 63% in January. Milk and fruits also rose by over 5% each. In an year when per capita income growth is lower and rural wages have so far continued to de-accelerate, higher inflation is very likely to pinch. Of course, food is only one part of our expenses. So what are the other categories suggesting? Here, inflation is still low even though it's rising. Prices of transport and communication rose by 6.08% and were driven by higher telecom tariffs. Inflation in the personal effects category, which also includes gold jewellery, is rising at above 7%. Overall, core inflation, which reflects demand conditions, rose to over 4.2% from 3.8% in December. But it still remains low. What does inflation mean for interest rates? Not much for now, since the central bank had forecast higher inflation, but still chose to retain its accommodative stance. That still leaves the door open to more interest rate cuts, even though economists believe that the central bank will wait for inflation to start easing before it can cut rates again. Now, in the corporate space, there was a, a major development uh, with regard to Yes Bank. It has delayed reporting its uh, December quarter results. The numbers uh, will now not be out uh, as of this month and will probably come in only in March. The lender cites the capital raising process where it's evaluating four non-binding investment offers as a reason for the delay. Ida Dugger reports. We got two bits of news from Yes Bank on Wednesday evening, both linked to the capital raising process, but also separate in their own rights. Uh, yes, there's new information about potential investors, and I'll get to that in a minute because that story, frankly, has dragged on for a year. Uh, but Yes Bank also said that they're delaying the publishing of their quarterly results. Uh, they should have published results uh, by 14th of February at the latest. They believe uh, they said that they have gotten exemption from SEBI and they will publish these results now, uh, latest by the 14th of March. Why are they delaying their results? Uh, well, Yes Bank says that the attention of the management is fully centered on the capital raising process and they are engaged in discussions uh, with a series of investors uh, and hence uh, they uh, would not be in a position to publish results right now. Let's stop there for a minute. Uh, that's uh, not a particularly legitimate explanation. This is a bank actually uh, which has been running for years on end, uh, fully functional, has different departments for everything, presumably from investor relations to capital raising, etc. Uh, it's difficult to believe that suddenly the bank finds itself in a position uh, that they are not able to uh, present routine quarterly results uh, while also managing a capital raising uh, process. So a question must legitimately be asked uh, as to what the bank is trying to do by uh, delaying its results. Uh, and you know, one reasonable expectation is that it's trying to manage the situation a little bit better. Uh, the results uh, could have presented uh, perhaps a worsening of the asset quality picture. Uh, there have been questions about how their deposit franchise has uh, played out as well. Uh, and maybe the bank is trying to manage that information coming out, whatever that information is, together with uh, news of capital raising because as we all know uh, the market has been keenly awaiting news uh, on capital raising they did provide fresh information on capital raising as well uh, the bank said it is uh, engaged in conversation with a number of investors it has named a few of these investors where they say they have received non-binding expressions of interest uh, these include uh, from companies like jc flowers tilden park oha 
Silver Point Capital. Uh, they say that the bank and the advisors are in talks with the investors on terms, including uh, potential pricing, a potential regulatory response to any of these investors wanting to pick up a uh, stake which is larger than 10%, which, is, uh, which would require the Reserve Bank of India's approvals. So clearly, this is all work in progress, but they have put out these names uh, of some investors who have put in non-binding expressions of interest. Uh, I think there is a third issue that is important here, uh, and that is the question of the pricing of any potential capital raising. Uh, now look at, uh, juxtapose the two events. Uh, yes Bank has delayed its results. Uh, that means these investors, if they are in conversation right now, will probably not have full information because uh, the bank will not be in a position to release this selectively uh, to any potential investors. Uh, so would these investors then be comfortable uh, at investing at the current price, particularly given uh, the SEBI formulas and the way they work? Uh, it's not clear that that would be the case. Uh, so uh, it must be also asked as to whether the investors who are in conversation with the bank uh, would want to consider the fact that these results uh, are being delayed. Uh, now, how does this finally play out? I think we've seen a few rounds of uh, potential investors being named by Yes Bank. Uh, so like, before making a judgment on whether the bank will be able to close it or not, uh, one will have to look at these steps pricing, the structure in which this investment uh, could potentially take place, and then, of course, whether regulatory approvals come through or not. Uh, along with that, uh, the uh, market also must take into account that results have been delayed. Right. Bharat Petroleum is one of the nifty companies reporting earnings today. Uh, Darshan Mehta is joining me to tell you all about that. Darshan, inventory gains likely to play a part? Yeah, that is. So if you're looking at it, uh, the top line growth is expected to be up almost 11 percent. On the profit front, it's expected to be down 23 percent. And there are reasons for it, which I will talk about it. EBITDA 14 percent and EBITDA margins are up almost 4 percent. Uh, the other important uh, aspect that you have to watch out is the GRM, which will be up uh, at $3.48 per barrel versus the earlier. 3.38. Now, what are the big factors? Uh, inventory gains, as you pointed out, that is uh, one of the things that may offset uh, the weak refining as well as marketing margin. So, on an anticipation, analysts are expecting inventory gains anywhere between 200 to 400 crores that could come in versus an inventory lost uh, last quarter. The other aspect which could play a little spoil sport is the forex. Uh, the, this time around, there is a forex loss that is anticipated in the tune of 130 to 150 crores. So, some bit of benefit of the inventory gain will go in from here. The Brent crude has averaged at almost $62 per barrel versus 62.14. So it's been pretty much at the same level. But the Singapore GRMs have fallen significantly. From $6.5 per barrel, it's now $1.7. And the high sales volume to aid marketing margins. Now, what can we expect? The crude throughput will is expected to be up almost 4%. And in terms of the marketing margins for petrol, uh, it is uh, anywhere between 2 point uh, uh, for petrol and diesel uh, is expected to be uh, from uh, it's expected to move from uh, uh, you know 3.4 to 3.2 and 3.7 to 2.2 for for diesel. Uh, the other thing is what do you watch out for? What's the commentary on debt as well as the pending subsidy truce? Any kind of uh, refining and marketing uh, outlook that the company can give? And finally, status of the Kochi pet chem business is something that we want to watch out. All right, thanks so much for that, Darshan. Now, that's all you need to know going into trade today, but of course, do stay tuned. You'll find all the live market action right here, and of course, all the breaking news in the world of business, politics, and of course, global coverage. You'll find all of that right here on Bloomberg Quint.